Hello, friends. This skinwalker is cool, but his horns need some changes. Be sure to subscribe to my channel. I have been volunteering every Friday afternoon at my local wildlife sanctuary, Pine Grove Wildlife Center, for about a year now. I started because I needed a reprieve from my unrewarding desk job, and stayed because of the great relationships I have formed with the injured birds of prey. Most of them have huge problems that prevent them from re-entering the wild. So we train them to perch to different spots on command, hop onto our gloved hands, or in the case that they can fly we walk them by letting them soar around the forest before calling them back to our gloves. The broad-winged hawk, for instance, went from clawing at my face every time I entered her cage to happily greeting me over the course of a hard-fought year. I could tell a similar story for every bird, but you get the idea I'm sure, and that is not what I'm here to share. I enjoy, or enjoyed working with the birds of prey so much that I was unfazed this past Saturday when the wildlife center director, I will call him Jay for privacy, called me after 6 p.m. to inform me that our Saturday volunteer, C, had never checked in to indicate that he had fed and worked with the birds. Jay said that he could not get in touch with C, and Jay himself was out of town at a conference, so I was the only person available to go check on the birds. Distressed at the thought of these animals who I have grown so attached to spending the day bored and the night hungry, I got in my car and snaked my way up the mountain road to the wildlife center. On a rough half hour drive into the deep woods, I wondered what C could be up to. It was not particularly odd to me that I had not known he was going away this week we really only talked at the once monthly staff and volunteer meetings but it was confusing that he had not told Jay, seeing as he has as much interest in the bird's health as I do. When I had finished parking my car safely in the dirt employee lot and trudging up the long footpath to the bird's enclosures, we call them mews. I could tell immediately that none of the birds had eaten today. They were too alert, too excited to see me. It was already past 7.30 pm by this point, so I resigned myself to the fact that even if every session went along very quickly, there was no way I would be leaving before nightfall. Every session did not move along smoothly. I realized things were going to be slower at this time of day when I tried to direct my first bird, a black vulture named Maid, to perch on a scale so I could check her weight. I looked her in the eye and gave two firm taps on the scale with the forceps we use for feeding tap tap and said perch. She did not even turn around, instead opting to keep her eyes glued out the window, Every session went on in this manner, such that it was almost midnight as I walked into the mew of the last birds I had to work with tonight the barred owls. I hung the center's electric lantern on a post inside their mew's tiny atrium as I rolled closed the outer door. The three species of owl we have barn, barred, and the screech owl all live in subsections of a larger wooden mew, which is in essence constructed like a wooden barn. None of them can see each other, because barred owls will eat other owls in the wild. I saved this particular session for last because, as I am fond of telling the other volunteers, the barred owls are my favorite. More than any other birds we have, they seem to crave human companionship. Consequently, they can be the fastest birds to work with because they do all of the behaviors we have taught them on the first try. As I tapped on their inner door to let them know I was there, I could hear them excitedly calling out to me. A regular barred owl call, for those who have not heard it, sounds like WHO cooks for you. WHO cooks for you. Who? Who? Of course. Nothing could be so easy that day. As soon as the two barred owls saw my face, they changed their tune. 
instead of a friendly call, they began to make territorial sounds. This call is far less pleasant it sounds just like a child's laughter, but there is something uncanny about it. I highly suggest looking it up to hear for yourself. I should have been analytical about this development. I should have stopped to appreciate that the owls had been expecting someone other than me and that they wanted me to leave. Neither of these thoughts played in my head. Instead, I simply assumed that they had somehow memorized the schedule and they were expecting C instead of me. I took out the closest owl's favorite scale and bent down to set it on his favorite perch. Even the most well-behaved birds have a favorite everything and deviating from it can greatly disturb them. While my head was pointed down and away from the window, I heard the faintest sound above Chef's insistent cackling. Who cooks for you? Who? Who? I froze. This sounded like an owl call, but it was clearly not. It was an imitation of one. The call rang out again and I knew the voice to belong to C. A wave of relief flooded over me I would much rather be snuck up on by someone I know this late at night than by a stranger. Without thinking, I called back WHO cooks for you. It still had not registered to me that two things were very wrong with the situation. Number 1. The lantern that I had hung up inside the mew was positioned right over the window. Someone standing in front of it would have cast a shadow, but I had stood there unperturbed in my reading of the scale as the call sounded directly above me. Number 2, I was now standing fully upright, I could still hear the call, and no one was in sight. Before I had a chance to process this, another call sounded, seemingly from right outside the outer door, WHO cooks for you. WHO cooks for you. My reaction to this call was far worse than the first one this voice was my own, played back to me with the exact same inflection and volume as I had used only seconds earlier. I could hear both of them now, calling softly but insistently at the front door. Feeling completely powerless, I turned off the lantern and tried to peer out into the atrium. I saw the door begin to slide on its track and, I am ashamed to admit, I did not have the stomach to look at what came through it. I simply latched the inner door from the inside and sat down on the floor, trying to will my body to make no noise whatsoever. As I sat crumpled up on the floor, I heard a tap tap on the inner door. This was done with the exact same rhythm I used to ask the birds to their perches. This was too much for me, and I resolved to remain holed up in the mew for as long as the door would hold. I must have fallen asleep that way because the floor of the owl's mew is where I woke up on Sunday morning. My phone was dead and I was exhausted, so I drove home and fell asleep for what remained of the day. That is why I didn't see the newspaper article Jay had sent me until Monday as I got ready for work it was a picture of two backpackers standing next to a state forest sign I recognized it to be one about 100 miles inland of us and the text is the reason why I hesitate to return to Pine Grove. C had been reported missing by his family a full week prior and the hikers pictured had stumbled across his body slung high in a pine tree. The description of his state included several unpleasant details, the most disturbing of these being six deep puncture wounds around his back and torso. I don't know what is out there, but until I get some answers I think I need to stay far away from Pine Grove.